afternoon, everyone, and to Grand Rounds. Uh, please join me in welcoming the speaker for today's Grand Rounds, uh, Professor Mike He will enlighten us with his lecture title, Skeletal Muscle and COPD, Now Treatable Trait. So a little bit about Professor Polky. He's a chess physician with 25 years of experience. He's, he trained at the University of Bristol and after qualification at several hospitals in London. He obtained his own thesis on the study of respiratory muscle from King's College London under the supervision of Professor John Moxham and Professor Sir, Sir Malcolm Green in 1998. In 2000, he was appointed as, as a consultant physician to the Royal Brompton Hospital in London, where he serves on the sleep and service. The Royal Brompton Hospital is a national center of excellence for patients with lung disease in the United Kingdom. He is interested in all aspects of advanced lung disease, which result in respiratory failure. Aside from COPD and sleep, he's a particular, ex particular expert in weaning from invasive mechanical ventilation, rehabilitation, cachexia, and lung disease, and respiratory, respiratory aspects of neurological diseases such as ALS and, and the management of chronic respiratory failure. He's also lead for the sleep service for NHS Highland, which is a remote part of the United Kingdom, which he manages both remotely and by person visit times annually. Since 2007, he's also professor of respiratory medicine at Imperial College and serve as deputy director of the Royal Brompton Hospital NIHR Respiratory Biomedical Research from 2007 to 2017. He has published over 250 peer-reviewed scientific articles um, and he's associate editor of Thorax, ERJ, which is a European Respiratory Journal, and in 2018 was awarded the COPD Gold Medal by the European Respiratory Society. Please welcome, uh, give me a warm welcome to Dr. Uh, Professor Bolke. George, thank you for that uh, generous welcome. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be here. The only thing that would make me happier would be if I was there in person, although uh, as we were hearing earlier, there's a good deal of the virus about, so perhaps uh, it's better to stay here. Um, I'm gonna talk about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, which is probably the most common respiratory disease in adults, uh, but a lot of, what I'm going to talk about is actually relevant to any chronic disease. So colleagues who deal with chronic liver disease, heart failure, uh, renal failure, much of what I say is applicable to those conditions also. So let's kick off. This is an electron micrograph of uh, lung and you can see, especially in the left hand corner of the picture, it's a bit torn and that's because this patient has emphysema. Um, and therefore the question arises, well, why are we interested in skeletal muscle? Well, um, let me show you this. I'm gonna show you more details from this paper later on, but this is a uh, study that uh, I took part in, organized by the COPD Foundation of America. And in a unique initiative, as far as I know unique, they managed to get big drug companies to pool the results of, of their studies. So the, the graph that you see in front of you is based on uh, if memory serves me, around 16,000 patients in several uh, multi-center studies. Uh, and the red line shows uh, the, the people who are allocated to a bronchodilator, uh, and the black line shows the people who are allocated to placebo. And the figures, the numbers, are six-minute walk distance. And what you can see extremely clearly in large studies, and this of course came as somewhat of a blow to the industrial members of the consortium, is that bronchodilators, which are very widely uh, prescribed and which uh, are make an enormous amount of money for uh, the companies that make them, have absolutely no impact whatsoever on the six minute walk distance. And so you suddenly start to ask the question, well, it's fine to treat the lung, but actually what the patient would like to do is walk further. Uh, the more you get into this, you see that health status has a very poor relationship with lung function. So on the horizontal axis here, we have FEV1, uh, which is the, 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 the pulmonary function test used to diagnose uh, COPD. And it's ranging from 10%, which is near to death, uh, and 90%, which is near to normal. On the vertical axis here, you see the St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire. And uh, it's a slightly perverse score because uh, a high score indicates bad uh, symptoms, so it's good to bring the score down. 
Uh, and as you can see, the relationship um, is not very good. In fact, if I just advance the slides, uh, you'll see it's rather like the sky at night. So once again, we're seeing that this key test to diagnose COPD has got very little uh, uh, relationship with the patient's perceived quality of life. Uh, and this observation has led various thinkers to think about the idea of treatable traits. And this uh, uh, paper that I've shown you here from the ERJ was the first group to articulate that. Uh, amazingly, because these are all very smart people on the on the authorship list, uh, they didn't, in the paper, in my view, really say what a treatable trait was. So they had to write another paper, which is here. Uh, and uh, in in happier pre-COVID times, they were obliged to go to Australia to write this paper. Um, and what they came up with was this. Um, you can see that uh, a treatable trait has to have a, a therapeutic target that is defined, uh, which has a biomarker, so you can measure its progress, and which would respond to a treatment or an intervention. And uh, they then simplified that by uh, arguing that the characteristics should be clinically relevant, relevant uh, identifiable and measurable, and lastly, treatable. Now, interestingly, much of their paper is concerned with other traits that they thought might be treatable, but the case I'm hoping to make to you today is that skeletal muscle is one of those. And uh, as I say, it's probably relevant to uh, colleagues in other disciplines also. So um, first thing to say is why, why, why do we think this is a, a, a discrete problem? Why isn't it just general disease? And I think the strongest answer to, to that comes from the biopsy appearances of uh, the leg muscles in COPD. So these are biopsies taken from one of my patients by one of my research fellows. Um, and what you can see is that the picture on the right, which comes from a COPD patient, there are many more green fibers. These are the type 2 fibers, uh, whereas the normal subject on the left has got a roughly equal balance of type 1 and type 2 fibers. Type 2 fibers um, are much more fatigable, but they produce more force. Uh, uh, but they also switch early onto anaerobic metabolism, and I'll show you the problem with that in due course. Uh, this was the, this Dr. Natanek in my laboratory did the largest study to date of muscle biopsies in COPD to try and address this question, because until this point it had been believed uh, on the basis of smaller studies that the fibers not only switched to type, but were also smaller in size. Now, if you look at the lower pa panel of these three graphs, you can see that in fact there was no significant difference in the size of the two most important types, which are type one here and type two here. But equally, if you look at the, the proportion, you can see very clearly that the COPD patients here have got many fewer type 1 fibers on the whole than, than the control subjects. And of course, the, the reverse was also the case. They had many more type 2 fibers than type 1 fibers. So this fiber switch, uh, which we see in COPD, but it's not unique to COPD because it has also been observed, for example, in heart failure, uh, is, a, is, def is a defining characteristic of a treatment. Um, and the consequence of this is that um, is is that uh, leg muscles tend to have more anaerobic metabolism. So this is a study that we did using NMR spectroscopy, and we were able to show that patients with COPD myopathy uh, generated a lower pH during uh, sustained contraction than control subjects. And the likelihood of doing that, interestingly, and if you look at the right-hand panel now, was related to the amount of intramuscular fat. So the muscles of, of these patients had actually changed to have a, a good deal more intramuscular fat in them also. Why is it important? Well, this, by the way, I always put this photograph in because I like to prove that I was young once, uh, but that's, that, that is King's College Hospital when I was doing my PhD. So when, when we exercise, normally the, the carbon dioxide that we produce is, uh, so the, sorry, the lactic acid that we produce is buffered to bicarbonate, changed to carbon dioxide and breathed out. But if you've got COPD, you can't do that. And these are just some data from a very old study that we did. And it, what I would just just shown to the junior fellows. These were, just, these were just ordinary guys with COPD walking. And what we did was we measured the blood gases at the end uh, and beginning of exercise. And what's interesting is that in a short treadmill brisk walk, brisk for them, 
their pH is dropping by half a point and the CO2 has gone up from 5.4 to 6.3. Sorry, these units, by the way, are all European. Apologies for that in advance. Um, but that drop of pH is enough uh, to put somebody from being normal to in the category where if they were in your emergency department, you would offer them non-invasive ventilation for an acute exacerbation of COPD. So uh, the lung mechanics of people with uh, big time COPD are very marginal and it does not help that their skeletal muscle produces CO2 that they cannot otherwise get rid of. Um, people have asked over the years why myopathy occurs and actually uh, almost all their guesses turned out to be wrong but I just want to show you some, show you some studies that we did on that. Um, Inflammation is, uh, is an interesting idea. So back in the day, people thought that uh, this was all, all about inflammation. And the, uh, the, conceptually, it was quite a nice idea. So you had all this inflammation going on the lung. The inflammation spilled over and made the muscles worse. Um, but my next slide um, uh, shows that that's not the case. So this is one of the first big European Union grants that we had. And if you look at the strength of the muscle, which is on the horizontal axis here, the quadriceps muscle, you can see that actually the weakest people also have the lowest level of uh, serum TNF alpha. Uh, and actually, when we looked for a range of cytokines, they were very low and in some cases undetectable. So we don't believe that uh, inflammation causes uh, skeletal muscle weakness. We then wondered about genetic predispositions, and I would draw your attention particularly to the graph on the left, where one of my former students and now a colleague uh, investigated ACE gene polymorphism. ACE gene polymorphism is quite influential for a number of things, including ICU survival and oxygen handling. Uh, and interestingly, people who had a double insertion of the ACE gene uh, were weaker than those who did not. Um, but you have to be very wary of this type of study. This led us to conduct a randomized controlled trial of ACE inhibitors. Uh, but when we did that, uh, what you can see is that in fact the, the, the ACE inhibitors given uh, uh, over a two month period resulted in lower peak workload rather than greater uh, in patients with COPD. Um, disuse, we believe, is very plausible and I'm going to talk to you more about that. We know that patients with any disease and certainly COPD patients are inactive and there's quite a substantial literature which I'm only going to touch on tangentially about uh, physical activity and step counts in COPD um, but they are known to be inactive we also know that some parts of the body are more inactive than others so of course if you're sitting down your leg muscles are inactive but if you've got COPD you're probably coughing and in this small study we did back in the day, we measured the cough strength of patients with COPD shown on the right and of healthy elderly control subjects. And we measured this by placing pressure sensors in the stomach and asking the patients to cough. And you can see that the COPD patients are certainly not weaker than healthy controls. And that's probably because they're continuing to use those muscles. Uh, if you remember in the in the legs we saw uh, fiber type changes and this led us much later on to do a diaphragm biopsy study uh, now we didn't of course just uh, biopsy the diaphragm gratuitously these were people having surgery for other reasons but we uh, we found the reverse changes to those that had been observed in the skeletal muscles so in the diaphragm of patients with COPD as their FEV1 fell you can see this in the top left panel the proportion of type 1 fibers that they had rose very nicely, um, indicating uh, and in fact confirming prior physio physiological observations that the diaphragm is actually fatigue resistant in COPD in, in contrast to some of the older books that may still be on the shelves of your library. So what, what is it about what is it about skeletal muscle wasting in chronic disease? Um, we've given this some thought and um, this is a complicated slide, and I won't uh, I won't uh, bore people with it because they can read the paper if they <laughs> if they uh, require a cure for insomnia. But what we essentially have identified is that uh, methylation of certain genes leads to a differential expression of microRNA, which seems to affect the sensitivity to inflammation and consequently the the regenerative capacity of um, of the muscle. But I think the important concept here to understand about muscle is that there is this general idea that the muscle wasting is, is bad. But if, if I can just simplify the cartoon that we have here and go on to the next slide, uh, this is really what's happening. So um, we are all evolved to uh, 
to really be Stone Age man. So if you're Stone Age man, there, that's my one of my great great grandfathers on the left. Um, he would suffer injury or illness, and he would use the amino acids in the muscle to fight whatever it was that had come along. And sometimes he would be successful, and then the muscle would regenerate. And sometimes he would be unsuccessful, and then he would expire. Um, and if you view it like that, muscle is a very useful resource, and quite a lot of animals change their muscle bulk uh, around the time. Bears, of course, are the best example who hibernate. Um, but this is the way we see cr chronic illness nowadays. So if you have chronic illness or acute illness with supportive care, again, you're going to use up your uh, muscle to fight that illness, just the same as Stone Age Man did. Um, but then the therapy fails, but for one reason or another, the patient doesn't die. And this leads to frailty. And that's the key concept in, in COPD, but also in many other chronic diseases. Uh, and this leads us to uh, the, the idea of a disease spiral. So I think we can all accept that um, the patient has pulmonary mechanics that are bad. That leads them to become breathless. This leads in turn, probably through disuse, to a myopathy. And the anaerobic metabolism causes it all to get worse. And so the inactivity spiral is a key part of that and may explain why some of the treatments, and I'm going to talk about this later on, some of the treatments like pulmonary rehabilitation are so helpful. So, the second, so having argued, I hope successfully, that uh, the skeletal myopathy is a real problem, the question then is, is it identifiable and measurable? Well, um, it's tricky, isn't it? On the left is a picture of me. Uh, no, not really. Um, <laughs> on the right is the well-known uh, drawing of the man with emphysema. But, of course, at some point, you have to get from A to B, and real life is, you know, is not com com composed of extremes, despite what you, the current presidential candidates might try to tell you. Um, so how do you measure it? On the left is the classic quadriceps chair, and I've put the reference there for those who want to read the ATS position statement. But the idea is that the patient sits in the chair, everything is all at right angles, and then they stretch their leg uh, as far as they can. But because this strap is inextensible, the leg doesn't move, so it's what we call isometric. But you measure the force generated with a strain gauge here, and a signal is comes out here that you can measure. This apparatus is not commercially available, and so while those of us who are interested in the field have it in our labs, um, it's tricky at a day-to-day -day level. So a few years ago on the right, we started to think about doing ultrasound of the uh, rectus femoris, that's this most anterior head of uh, the quadriceps, uh, and that is something that can be done at the bedside. It's uh, obviously free of ionizing radiation. You can do it if you wish, and we have done in ICU on a daily basis. So, uh, and we were able to show, I don't think I've included it in my slide pack, a good relationship between strength and rectus femoris cross-sectional area. So we have good tools to get a handle on quadriceps weakness. Um, and rather like, uh, in, in, indeed as expected from, uh, from what I showed you with lung function, you can see that uh, quadriceps size, not just on the vertical axis here, and quadriceps strength on the vertical axis here, has only got a very weak relationship with the severity of airflow obstruction. So controls in both cases are better, but the gold stages are not very, very different uh, going down. And that, of course, reflects the fact that gold stage is not a really good marker of uh, the physical function of the patient. Um, these are, these are data from the ERICA study, which I set up with colleagues, where we assessed patients at five centres in the UK. Uh, and again, the same story, that the relationship of strength on the vertical axis to FEV1 uh, is really the sky at night. Uh, and our view is that that's telling you that FEV1 is not a very good marker of COPD severity. Um, there are easier ways to assess quadriceps strength, and I want to draw your attention to something that we call the short physical performance battery, and if we have any care of the elderly specialists in the audience, they'll likely be familiar with this. But it comprises three simple tests that can be done anywhere. The first is a balance test, and uh, you get different points for whether you can stand with your feet side by side or in front of each other. The second is a gait speed assessment where you simply need two bits of sticky tape four meters apart on the floor and you time the patient's speed walking between one marker and the next. And the third is a sit to stand type test. This can be done by anybody with a stopwatch um, and, and a room and a chair. Um, and it gives you a score out of 12. So one of the problems with this test is that there's a sort of ceiling effect. You can't get more than 12. But 
what I would also say is that whilst the top one is a categorical variable, the second and third are continuous variables. So people have explored gate speed as a continuous variable on its own. But to score it, uh, you use these numbers here in the right hand side of the panel and allocate points to give yourself points out of 12. Um, and one of the earlier studies we did with this in our lab was to look at the short physical performance battery score and relate it to uh, the muscle biopsy appearances. And what you can see here is that, of course, there's some overlap, but the fact is people with a low SPPP score, don't forget a low score is bad, have got a higher proportion of the type 2 uh, fibers, so they are more likely to have the myopathic changes that are typical of COPD. If you uh, then start getting into it more detail on some of the other phenotypic aspects, uh, again, you see not unexpectedly that people with a low SPPP score have got low six minute walk distances, but they also, again, have small quadriceps muscles if you measure it by ultrasound. Um, and we went on and looked at this in the Erica data cohort, it's a much larger cohort, 700 patients, and this is, data has just come out this year. And it, interestingly, the most discriminative uh, test in terms of separating out the COPD patients was the sit to stand test alone uh, in that context. Um, the four meter gate speed is a very good predictor of readmission. So in the left hand panel here, you see data from around 200 patients who were admitted to a community hospital uh, out on the edge of London, which is affiliated with ours, with an acute exacerbation of COPD. And what we've done here is simply measure the gate speed on the day of discharge and look at the likelihood of being readmitted at 90 days. Uh, and expressed it by quartile. And what you can clearly see is that the lower quartile here. Uh, which represents a four meter gate speed of less than 0.8 meters per second has got a much higher risk of readmission um, and uh, again if you oh, sorry if you look at the right hand panel this is a, a rock plot of different models but you get the most uh, success with uh, four meter gate speed plus one previous submission but actually uh, the, the line that model three that's this gray line here represents a four meter gate speed alone and is quite a lot better than charms which would as I think you all know be the diagonal line along the middle. So um, the, the relevance of this is enormous because you can use this uh, this test that takes literally five minutes to do to stratify the risk of the patient being readmitted and use that information to guide community resource to the patient whether you want to allocate them more frequent visits from home nurses or community rehabilitation or some kind of monitoring system to check their safety I mean how you how you act on this information is if you like up to you but there is a very very simple test that allows you to identify this Importantly, though, this is a population with a high pretest probability of admission because, as I'm sure you all know, 30% of patients with an acute exacerbation of COPD are readmitted uh, within one month. Um, so we looked, we used the same data um, in the Erica cohort. These, don't forget, were community stable patients. And we found again that the SPPB score. Uh, here we've split it into nine points or less, 10 or 11 points, or the ceiling, 12 points, uh, does seem to predict uh, the time to first hospitalization, even in entirely stable patients. This is over a period of five years, um, although clearly the effect is not as marked and you wouldn't expect it to be so marked in a population with a low pretest probability. So um, the next question then is, are these data, is it, are these things actually clinically relevant? Do they actually matter? Um, well, they certainly do. So again, coming back always to this link with the fiber type, you can see that the higher proportion of type 1 fibers you have, in other words, the more normal you are, the higher six minute walk distance you have, and the higher VO2 max you have. Um, on the other hand, if we look at FEV1, that's in the top panel here, you can see that uh, if you divide the COPD patients and those who have fiber shift and those who don't have fiber shift, there's actually no difference at all by FEV1 or, or, or DLCO, or at least such small with DLCO. Um, making the point, just making this point, I'm making over and over again by m means of repetition, which, which is that the FEV1 doesn't seem to really drive the symptoms. It's actually what's happening in the legs. Uh, 
uh, and consistent with this, this is not a study from our lab, this is a study from uh, Mick Steiner and Neil Greening up in Leicester, um, where they used our ultrasound technique to predict readmission or death again after an acute exacerbation of COPD. And again, you can see the, 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 the people with the smallest cross-sectional area, that's quartile one, are very much more likely to be readmitted to hospital over a 12-month period. Uh, confirming once again that it's the skeletal muscle that predicts your likelihood of being able to avoid coming in. Um, the death story had been revisited before. This is data from Francois Maltais. Um, uh, many of you will remember this coming out. It was extremely influential at the time. Uh, the only point I would make is that these are very extreme examples. So if you look at his Kaplan Meier curves, uh, the FEV1 less than 50% predicted and a mid-thigh cross-sectional area less than 70 square centimetres. This group does very badly, as you can see quite clearly. But to be at that stage, you really have to be looking a bit like the guy that I showed you in the photo earlier, who's in, in the classic medical diagrams. That's a very small mid-thigh cross-sectional area. These are data from our cohort. Uh, where we use strength rather than imaging to predict transplant-free survival. But again, it's the same story, unfortunately, that if you've got reduced quadriceps strength, that's the dotted line here, uh, your transplant-free survival at four years in our hospital is about five, uh, it's about five years. And you know that compares for unfavorably with many solid organ tumors. Um, interestingly, again, if you look at the uh, graph of FEV1 here, uh, these are the hazard ratios, you can see that once you get below about 50 percent the uh, hazard ratio changes very little as FEV1 changes in contrast to strength where it's a more linear relationship and as a final proof of all this uh, we got together all the people in the world who are interested in this and looked at survival as a function of fiber shift and again it's the same story the patients who have the fiber shift are likely to die earlier than the patients who do not so I think what I would like just to recap where we are at the moment, what I've shown you is that there is a, 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 an identifiable trait that you can identify either directly by biopsy or, uh, or, or by surrogate measures, either simple field tests or complicated imaging techniques. And whichever way you slice it, the people who have this problem uh, have uh, poorer outcomes and they have uh, poorer functioning in terms of exercise performance whilst they're alive. So, of course, the question that all doctors really like to ask is, is it treatable? Um, this, was the, this is the paper I showed you right at the start, which showed that bronchodilators uh, uh, absolutely do not improve exercise performance. Um, although we do know that uh, six mm water distance can be increased by surgical lung volume reduction. Uh, which is a much more drastic intervention but of course very few people are eligible for that um, and this brings us back to the key point of rehabilitation this uh, to my knowledge is the first randomized controlled trial of pulmonary rehabilitation but it wasn't very big it only had 12 people in it um, but they were able to show a significant improvement in the oddly enough in the 12 meter i don't know why they didn't do six meter in the 12 meter walking distance um, but no improvement in the control subjects uh, and what's really interesting is to say that they only needed 12 patients in each group. Now, when you think about, you know, some of the big trials that are required to show the things that we all now take for granted, like beta blockers in heart failure or, uh, you know, ACE inhibitors in heart failure, those are trials that to show an effect, you need, you need thousands of patients, but they were able to show this with just actually 12 patients. Of course, people did do bigger tri trials. This is uh, Thierry Trusters from Leuven. He managed to get the numbers up to about 60. Um, and uh, this is the, again, this is the control group, this is the training group, and this is the change with treatment. And you can see uh, that uh, FEV1, um, which is up here, does not, there's no difference at all between the two groups of treatment, which you wouldn't expect, but we're seeing significant improvements in six minute walking distance, and they're associated, interestingly, with changes in quadriceps strength. So the idea here is that pulmonary rehabilitation. Uh, improves the strength of your locomotor muscles and permits you to walk further. I'd be happy in the questions afterwards to take questions on this because I understand that one of the problems in the United States is provision of pulmonary rehabilitation. Um, Tim Griffiths, who unfortunately died, uh, did an even larger study, but still by drug company standards, a small study, 200 patients, 
and he was able to show over a two-year period that pulmonary rehabilitation uh, reduced hospital bed days, 10 versus 21 days. There were more primary care consultations, presumably due to patients trying to optimize their treatment, but fewer out-of-hours consultations and uh, an improvement in walking distance that was maintained at least at one year. Um, one of the problems with pulmonary rehabilitation is access to the pulmonary rehabilitation, and that may be through reimbursement issues, which I understand is part of the problem in the United States. It's very often through behavioral or societal issues, you know, simply, for example, transport to the center or um, a feeling that, you know, you know the, the, perhaps the patient doesn't deserve it. And we know that non-compliance is associated with higher levels of depression, so you have to encourage patients to come. Um, but it can also be to do with uh, uh, availability of equipment. So this is a map of China, and this place uh, labelled A uh, is the hometown of my longtime friend and collaborator, Professor Lo. Um, and when you go there, it's pretty rural. So this is the first time I went. Uh, the residents had a healthy uh, mistrust of the uh, the state's ability to provide food. So they were reluctant to buy milk uh, in the supermarket. So they insisted on seeing it delivered in the marketplace. This photograph was taken early one morning in the marketplace. Uh, they like to see it come out of the animal itself. Um, and then they quite like to see the animal as well afterwards. Uh, so it's an amazing place, but absolutely no, uh, nowhere that could afford pulmonary rehabilitation. The typical uh, income in this city is about $100 a month, I believe. But what they do like is Tai Chi, and this is the hospital Tai Chi team uh, demonstrating for us uh, how, how, how good it is. Uh, so we did a trial of Tai Chi. Um, we had to screen a lot of subjects to get patients uh, with COPD, because many patients in, in China with COPD are undiagnosed, uh, and they're also many of, very often untreated, so they don't have easy access to bronchodilators. Um, uh, but in the end, we got 60 patients who did Tai Chi and 60 patients who did classical pulmonary rehabilitation. And to make sure they were doing it properly, we actually flew our rehab team over from the Brompton to, to make sure that all the kit was good and the protocols were being followed. Uh, and these are the data. So the first two weeks was a run-in period when they started the uh, uh, a bronchodilator. They then had 12 weeks of treatment and then they had a uh, further 12 weeks off treatment. And what you can see is there's absolutely no difference at all between the effect of Tai Chi and classical rehabilitation. But in the treatment, after, in the phase after treatment, uh, there did seem to be a slight uh, improvement in SGRQ in the Tai Chi group uh, compared, to, um, compared to the rehab group. Uh, which you can see here. Um, an alternative strategy, a further alternative strategy that's been explored by Will Mann and our group is neuromuscular electrical stimulation. Now, I don't know um, if this is ever popular in, this, in the States, but when I was a PhD student myself, I used to cycle to work, and at the time, I still cycle to work, but at the time, the buses used to have adverts on the back for a slender tone device. And what that was, was a, a sort of electrical stimulator that you would put under your shirt. And the idea was, while you're tapping away at your keyboard, you would be gradually toning up your uh, abdominal muscles. And eventually, you would look like the chap that I showed you in the picture earlier. Well, we didn't do that. But we used a similar approach to stimulate the quadriceps muscle uh, and compared it with placebo. These were pretty sick patients. You can see the six-minute walk distance at the start was 216 meters. They are basically gold stage three, four disease. And importantly, in view of Dr. Mann's previous work, they were definitely, if you like, in the high-risk group with a four-meter gait speed, approximately 0.8 meters per second. Uh, the treatment period was six weeks. And you can see that, as you always see in clinical trials, the control group has a slight improvement. But the rectus femoris cross-sectional area increased uh, by about 75 square millimeters in the, uh, in the treatment group. And interestingly, and you remember we, I made the point earlier about how muscle is plastic, once you stopped stimulating them, the body took those amino acids back. And even by 12 weeks, you can see they're reverting back towards the control group. Um, but in terms of clinical effect, uh, the, there was an improvement in f of the six-minute walk distance of 36 meters in the treatment group. Uh, and from a previous study, uh, which I just the reference down there, we know that the MCID for the six-minute walk distance is around 30 meters. Um, 
So this was an interesting idea because it demonstrated to us that if you could change the size of the muscle, uh, you, you might be able to actually improve walking distance without doing anything else at all. Because the whole thing about pulmonary rehab, of course, is that it is, uh, in the minds of the enthusiasts, a multidisciplinary program. So this, of course, leads to the question of whether or not medicines could do this, because that would be lovely if they could. And uh, TNF blockers were tried. Um, they didn't work, which didn't surprise us when we subsequently found there wasn't much inflammation going on. Um, but actually, that trial was stopped early because of an excess uh, uh, number of cancers in the treatment group. And I suppose, uh, with hindsight, the clue was in the name. So tumor necrosis factor is not called tumor necrosis factor for nothing. Uh, people have also explored myostatin. I'm going to show you our study on that. Uh, uh, they've explored ghrelin antagonism, and of course, uh, people have also been interested in androgens, which I'm not going to talk about, although I'm happy to. So myostatin is a very interesting thing. Uh, myostatin is a negative regulator of muscle mass. So if you don't have any myostatin, if you're a myostatin knockout, you're very, very muscly. And this bull here, this Belgian blue, uh, is in fact a myostatin knockout. So the Belgians uh, worked this out empirically back in the 17th and 18th centuries. But the good thing about that in terms of trying it in a human level is that these bulls are otherwise perfectly healthy. So it does imply to you that it is at least safe to downregulate myostatin should you wish to. Uh, there's a single case report you see in the right hand panel in humans. Uh, this, this child came from a family of exceptionally strong laborers and uh, had, had very advanced motor milestones and again proved to be a myostatin knockout. Uh, and we found, if you look at in the lower panel, uh, that the levels of myostatin were uh, highest in in patients who, um, sorry, lowest, I should say, in patients who had the greatest six minute walk distance and the greatest quadriceps strength, uh, whereas people who had high levels of myostatin did not have good performance. So um, when uh, the people are made, not actually a myostatin antibody, although those drugs exist, uh, but a drug that blocked the myostatin receptor, the active in 2B receptor came along, we were extremely interested in that. Uh, so this study involved two uh, infusions of the active in 2B receptor blocker, uh, eight weeks apart, uh, with the aim of uh, suppressing myostatin functioning. Um, and in terms of getting into the trial, we chose patients who uh, either had a very low BMI or who had a low appendicular mass on DEXA scanning. Um, again, fairly small numbers. This was an early stage trial, um, about 30 in each group, but quite good completion rates. Um, and what you can see here is that thigh muscle volume measured by MR improved quite substantially with uh, active in 2B receptor blockade, which is exactly what you would expect. Um, Unfortunately, for our hypothesis, if I then th throw in the six-minute walk distance numbers, you can see there's no difference at all in the uh, in the treatment group and the placebo group. But it did at least show that it was possible pharmacologically to change muscle mass in patients with COPD. So I think one of the things, having said at the start, that this this data goes across a whole bunch of medical conditions. One of the unique things about COPD is exacerbations and for my non-pulmonary colleagues uh, what COPD patients get is they get episodic worsening of their condition which is usually triggered by a virus although secondary bacterial infection is common and this is treated with steroids which have a known effect on muscle and antibiotics but because the patient is feeling ill they of course have reduced physical activity during the exacerbation and they have uh, evidence of inflammation. As I said to you before, the 30-day readmission rate in most countries is about a third, uh, and the risk of death during admission is 7%. So acute exacerbation of COPD, which is sufficiently severe to lead to hospital admission, is a very serious medical problem, and it's also a huge uh, public health cost. Um, this is uh, my colleague uh, Visha, who will be well known to you all as the editor of the Blue Journal and her group, uh, looked at six minute walk distance and quadriceps strength uh, in patients with uh, very mild exacerbations of the COPD, not sufficiently severe to bring them into hospital. But you can see that between being stable, because they, in their model, they study these patients regularly and then get them up when they have an exacerbation. Between being stable and both day three and day seven, uh, 
not so much on day seven, there's a drop in six minute walk distance. And again, there's also a drop in quadriceps strength on both days. So even mild exacerbations are associated with some uh, muscle wasting. Uh, and Martin Spruitt in a really landmark study back in the day showed that between day three and day eight, there's quite a substantial drop in muscle strength in patients who are hospitalized with uh, acute exacerbation of COPD, which persists in some cases even at 90 days. Now, um, the really interesting thing about this graph to me is what's happening in this gap here. So why is there no data here? Um, but I think we now know with the studies I've shown you previously that the reason there was no follow-up for those people is that they have a very high likelihood of readmission um, because we know that quadriceps function strength and so on predicts readmission. Um, but nevertheless, exacerbation is a trigger to an accelerated decline of, uh, of, of uh, locomotor muscle strength. And that being the case, you might ask yourself the question, well, would that not be the best time to apply an anabolic stimulus? Um, and this is again a study by Dr. Mann in our group. Again, a small study, which you know, some people say small studies are not good, but my view is that actually, if you can show an effect with a small study, this must be a very powerful intervention. So he randomized 42 patients who had been admitted with acute exacerbation of COPD to either have best usual care or to have early uh, community rehabilitation. And of course, it's a clinical trial, there's some dropouts. But what he found was that the likelihood of coming to the accident and emergency department was greatly reduced by uh, early pulmonary rehabilitation. Now, we found these we were pleased, of course, but we found these results. You know, we, we wondered, were they too impressive? So we actually repeated the study. And those of you that are interested can go and look at the subsequent study um, in thorax. But we found um, that the healthcare patterns have changed slightly between 2004 and 2010, but we still found benefits to early uh, pulmonary rehabilitation, but they were benefits in terms of hospital admission rather than A&E attendance. So how does it all work? Um, my view really is that strength here is is a crumple zone um so if you're strong or something comes along you're kind of going to be okay it's a bit like you may see your bank balance as a crumple zone you know if you've got a healthy bank balance then when you suddenly decide you've got to buy a new washing machine you're okay and so with that model you can imagine the virus which is all around us um, this is by the way an ordinary coronavirus it's not a special covid19 coronavirus um, if you're strong then you get a bit of a cold and but you're kind of okay but if you're weak then you end up uh, you know in this kind of position um, and that being the case, uh, you would think that short physical performance uh, would actually predict the risk of death in patients with COPD. So this is a very recent analysis from the uh, Erica cohort, uh, where we asked the question, if we put elements of the short physical performance uh, battery into the Bode score instead of the six minute walk, because it's actually very difficult to do the six minute walk in a busy clinical unit, would it make any difference? And the short answer is, you can see here, whether you use SPPB or even actually four meter gate speed alone, uh, all of these are highly predictive in, uh, in five year mortality in patients with COPD. And this is in a multi-center UK setting. So assessing the frailty, treating the frailty, these are all very much, in my view, treatable traits. So, uh, as I say, identification, uh, just to leave you now with some recommendations. In terms of identification, uh, I would strongly recommend the SPPB to you. It's extremely simple to do. Uh, we would have it done in this country by physiotherapists, uh, but obviously your system is different. Um, there is an intervention, which is rehabilitation. We know that rehabilitation works. I've shown you good data on that. It probably works especially well if you give it at a time when the patient has lost muscle, which is perhaps not totally surprising. Uh, so I would recommend rehabilitation after acute exacerbation of COPD, whether it's an inpatient or an outpatient. But you have to ensure that you deliver the COPD to everybody. So you need to make sure there's enough provision for uh, rehabilitation across the patch. You need to try to make sure that people take up the offer of pulmonary rehabilitation. We have the advantage in this country, of course, that it's free, uh, but even so, there are ancillary costs to getting there. So you may need to provide hospital transport. Um, 
and then you need to ideally have some form of maintenance of the, of the exercise program after you've delivered the program. Uh, to that end, and in certain uh, jurisdictions, low-cost rehabilitation strategies are of great interest. So uh, I was interested in Tai Chi, and I've shown you that data. But in, for example, rural Australia, they have developing video rehab programs. And I think there's going to be a lot more interest in that kind of uh, area. I've heard of other systems in other countries where, for example, rehabilitation patients will engage in a sort of once-weekly cycling club. And, and probably the message is it doesn't quite matter what you're doing in the sense that something is definitely better than nothing. Um, behavioral interventions against sedentarism are also important, we believe. I haven't shown you the data in this study, but one of the European studies we did used a pedometer-based training intervention to improve uh, physical performance, and we were able to show that there was some uh, value there. And this is an area that's very fast moving and merging probably with consumer behavior interventions also. Um, I certainly think at the moment, unfortunately, that there are no medicines that are licensed for this, this, this problem. I think medicines may come. The difficulty that people who make medicines have is working out how to go from something that builds muscle, and there are many, many drugs that can do that in rodents, to uh, having a product that can have a viable labeling claim and a reimbursement claim from payers. because the real problem with drug development is you need to somehow get from the biological action to a clinical action and normally it's it's incremental so uh, normally people have a, a really sound biomarker that they want to measure and they get confidence from that and then they go on and do a subsequent study that pr proves mortality and in this field of physical frailty that is much more difficult um but I would, this, is, this slide is somewhat duplicative, but I, but I would say that uh, COPD remains a very, very major problem, and we certainly need some novel therapies, and the eventual sort of winner is most likely to be multimodal and involve components of all of these things. On that note, um, I think I'll draw things, Dr. Weiss, to a close, if I may. If it, there may be some questions. If not, I can tell a funny story about the hat. Dr. Polkey, thank you for an excellent grand round. One of the blessings and curses of Zoom is that uh, we can have uh, experts like you from all over the world come uh, and visit with us, which is great. The, the minus of giving a lecture to 132 faceless people is that you don't get to see a smile and giggle uh, at the appropriate times. And so I can assure you the feedback was, uh, was very, very positive. I would like to ask you um, something to begin, and then I do want to hear the story about the hat. Um, the, uh, the, the, um, the issue of teasing apart the population of patients that get steroids inhaled or otherwise in terms of, you, you alluded to the, and mentioned the fact that there's a profound effect of even inhaled steroids on uh, muscle fiber type and so forth, and whether or not that is exacerbating the problem as we look at the rehabilitation of these patients or um, part of the problem as we begin. And secondly, may you touch on uh, aminophilin or theophylline, which is no longer used, but at some point when I was training, the idea was that it increased muscle um, strength, and that in itself was a reason to to, to try it, which of course we don't do anymore for many other reasons. But would you care to comment on, on those two things? Yeah, I'd be absolutely delighted. Um, I, 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 I may have expressed myself badly. We don't, we don't think that inhaled steroids are, are particularly harmful for the muscle, but, uh, but, the, but, the, but the things they're given for, like exacerbation, may be harmful. And that, I guess, was the point I was trying to make. Steroid uh, tablets, uh, of course, are harmful for the muscle, although um, in stable patients, and I didn't show this data, but one of the very uh, earlier studies we did in my group was to give, it was back in the day, and some of the older members on the call may remember this, where it was felt that you had to identify who had reversibility and who didn't. So it was practice at that time to give people two weeks of prednisolone, 30 milligrams daily, to see if they had asthma or not. Um, and actually, we didn't see as big a change in muscle strength as we wanted, and that, as we thought. And that was one of the things that made me think that actually the thing about exacerbation is not. The, all the medicine and the uh, and the information, but there's also the inherent sedentarism and immobility that goes with the exacerbation. Um, and 
at the risk of digressing, I will come back to your other question, Dr. Weiss. Um, one of the studies I did when I was a, a PhD student, which I'm very fond of, although we found it very hard to publish, was a study where we studied the strength in people who had a stroke. Now, the ethics committee thought we were crazy because we wanted to study the good side, not the bad side. They said, why don't you study the bad side? And I said, we're not interested in that. But I was interested in the good side because these patients, of course, had enforced immobility by being hemiplegic. Um, and we saw quite dramatic drops in the strength on the good side in the first week of hospital admission, again, for that same reason. Now, you know, that'd be a hard study to do now in the, day, in the days of thrombolysis and endarterectomy and so on. But uh, there we are. Um, um, in answer to your question about the theophylline and the subutamol, you're quite right. There were some papers on that, including a very prestigious one in the New England Journal back in the, I think, I think I'm right in saying the late 70s, but correct me if I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> My, 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 my mentors did some studies on that themselves, much smaller studies, um, using nerve stimulation techniques, and they were never able to satisfy themselves that it had, a, had an effect. But in any case, as all the clinicians in the room know, that if you give them at that dose, they make you feel so ill that you'd rather be weak. <laughs> Correct. Thank you. Um, there's a comment in the chat uh, that complimenting you on such an outstanding talk. And the question about a um, uh, uh, whether or not there was pulmonary rehab available, and indeed there's a very robust pulmonary rehab program at UM. Perhaps we need to uh, help develop a better program at our uh, Jackson partner. Um, and also, um, is there a video site that you recommend for Tai Chi or home strengthening exercises? For COPD patients. Yeah, well, I think the I think those questions both play into each other. I, I don't have a recommendation for that, but I do think that in the days of COVID, in particular, and of course, this, don't forget, COVID survivors are also going to have significant skeletal muscle weakness. We've seen that. Um, there will be a need to develop more standardised telemedicine programs and to um, and and to get them out around the place. So uh, our, our physios are working on that now, and I'm quite sure other big groups are around the world too but it, it it is interesting because in the past i mean I, i'm not very clear on the geography of florida but let's say jackson is close to miami in the past you would have been naturally their provider but actually if the guys in california can develop a better program they might suddenly start providing that sort of care to the people in florida or if they're doing it by video so uh you, you know this is quite interesting actually in a in a health economic way if you like good well i don't see any other questions yet but maybe you can Tell us about the hat. Oh, yeah. Well, Naresh, this is for you because you're a sleep doctor and this is a hypoxia story. So um, this hat, we were up in uh, the mountains uh, near Tibet, actually, and um, it's at four and a half thousand meters or something. So uh, I was pretty hypoxic. The guy assured me it was genuine fox fur and extorted uh, a huge number of American dollars for it. Uh, but uh, when I got down to sea level, I'm afraid it turned out to be plastic. So there's a message in there somewhere. Okay, is the message that hypoxia does something very, uh, uh, has ill effects on our, in your, in your cognitive processing? Is that? Either that or a liberating effect on my wallet, Naresh, yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's certainly true. Now, let, let me, since you actually, it was funny that you brought up this idea of altitude. You, you know, you talked a lot about FEV1 and its lack of correlation with what you see histologically, what you see functionally. But what about the degree of hypoxemia? I mean, one of the key things that we know about COPD, particularly as the FEV1 starts dropping, these individuals will develop exercise-related impairment, uh, they, they desaturate, et cetera. So what is the impact of the hypoxemia, even mild hypoxemia, on some of these, on these uh uh, histological and functional changes of the quad and of course the diaphragm also there, yeah, there yeah. has to be well it's a good question um the first thing to say is that uh, you know if you think about a classical pink puffer a, a bit like the guy whose picture i showed halfway through the talk you know you can have extreme skeletal muscle wasting and be a pink puffer with a normal arterial oxygen um the second thing to say is that if if hypoxia were the whole story um, then you wouldn't expect the differential changes that we see in muscles in different parts of the body because the blood is going to all parts of the body equally. Um, but the um, the uh, but the third thing to say is that it's, what's probably a bit more relevant is around um, 
tissue hypoxia and uh, oxygen delivery to the tissues. So again, I didn't show all these studies, but one of the studies we did was around capillarity and we did find that there are changes in capillarity and we're just doing some work now on uh, beetroot juice, which is an oxygen donor. And we were able to show that if you used beetroot juice in patients with COPD, they had a lower oxygen cost of, uh, of exercise. Um, perhaps because they're delivering it better to the hospital. To, to, yeah. to, Dr. Siddharth, Dr. Siddharthan has a, a question. Uh, thanks for the uh, talk, Dr. Polky. I just had a quick question on, on just following up on Naresh's uh, comments and questions. Is the skeletal distribution weakness similar to that seen in IPF and other non rheumatologic ILDs or even chronic conditions? And then my follow-up to that, is, in essence, would be, are there sub-phenotypes that might be preferentially responsive to therapy? Because I know that you know, uh, skeletal weakness in COPD is sub subject to the same limitations in COPD as a whole and the heterogeneity of disease and sort of some of this graveyard of therapeutics that have been applied. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think the problem is you get overtaken by events. So if you've got IPF, you might well die of the IPF before some of these other changes can come into play. But um, in essence, yeah, so I, uh, my colleague, Dr. Mann, who's well known in the field and done amazing work, he's done a whole bunch of work on IPF and it's a very similar story. Okay. Well, again, I want to thank you very much, Dr. Polky and everyone for attending today's Grand Rounds. And uh, we, we wish you safe travels back to uh, England and uh, <laughs> yeah. and we, we appreciate everyone's participation. Please don't hit, please remember uh, to uh, use the MOC and CME links so that you can obtain credit for this terrific lecture. Everyone have a safe day and a great day. Great, see you everybody. Take care, Michael. Will do.